Okay, uh, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us on uh, another machine uh, learning launch seminar uh, today. Uh, I'm uh, really glad to uh, have uh, Dr. Chen Feng, uh, who is an assistant professor at NYU. Uh, Chen uh, is appointed across many departments, a civil engineering mechanics, civil and engineering uh, department, as well as the computer science. Uh, his lab uh, is called AI Force, and it aims to advance robot vision uh, and uh, machine learning through multidisciplinary used inspired research that originates from engineering domains. Before NYU, uh, Chen was a research scientist in the computer vision group at Merrill in Cambridge, uh, focusing on localization, mapping, and deep learning for self-supervising cars and robotics. Um, uh, well, without further ado, uh, we, we are all ears to hear uh, about your research, Chen. Thanks a lot for, for the kind introduction. Uh, let me start sharing my screen. Uh, you need to enable me yes. to share a screen. Uh, oh, now I can. Yes, now I can do it. All right. Can you see it? Yep. Okay. Since I only have one screen, I um, I guess uh, if anyone have any questions, feel free to just uh, unmute and 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 uh, ask the question. I hope there's some good discussion. Um, so again, thanks a lot for uh, inviting me to this uh, seminar. It is a great pleasure. I think Sohel and I met at CVPR this year during the breakfast. <laughs> um, and, uh, and yeah, thanks a lot for having me. So today I'm, I would like to give this talk on 3D deep learning for soft robotics and self-driving. Um, okay. So again, yeah, my, my lab's name is AI Force. Um, uh, we aim to develop novel algorithms uh, for intelligent agents so they can accurately and efficiently interact with materials and humans in dynamic and unstructured environments. Um, so because of this, our research methodology um, is multidisciplinary um, and use inspired uh, in the sense that we uh, talk to a lot of domain, uh, like engineering domain ex experts, understand what are the problems that they're facing and try to abstract that um, into some computational and robotics um, uh, questions that we can study in the university in academic settings. And hopefully the solutions can then um, be applied to more than just this one application domain after it is developed. Um, so the, our, our lab uh, have the uh, technical expertise. Let me see if I can, okay, cool, yeah. So our, our lab have the technical expertise in uh, robotics and AI mainly focusing on computer vision, robot perception, machine learning. In engineering, we care about smart city applications, also construction robotics. Uh, because not probably not many of you are aware of construction robotics, I just wanna give a very high level um, uh, introduction. So um, construction industry has been um, um, uh, suffering from many challenges and, and this has been like over many, many decades, right? So they have this high rate of injuries on the, on the job site and, and especially uh, job site facilities. And also uh, the construction industry compared to other industries like manufacturing, um, um, it's, it's the, the, the labor productivity growth rate is really slow, almost zero um, uh, increase in the labor productivity. So, there is a, a, a strong demand in society, um, both industry and academia, uh, to introduce more AI and robotics into this old traditional engineering domains um, in order to solve those problems, at least alleviate some of the issues. Um, and what's interesting and what um, um, uh, caused me interested in this, in this problem domain is because um, it is um, so similar to the um, manufacturing and, and transportation like self-driving cases, yet um, in order to, um, in addition to the uh, existing challenges that we face in manufacturing and self-driving transportation areas, in construction there are additional challenges like you need to address these unstructured and dynamic environments unlike the car manufacturing factories, right? And also, unlike the self-driving cars, you need to address the 
um, uh, more material manipulation and more collaboration with human workers. So uh, this, this is why this problem domain attracts me. But today, um, our talk um, is going to focus mainly on uh, a more technical uh, uh, area that is called uh, 3D deep learning or deep learning on 3D data. Um, and uh, the reason why um, uh, we are interested in this domain is also related to my um, uh, research in, like, in, the, in the construction robotics. Because basically, um, previously, a lot of uh, deep learning applications have been focusing on processing image or video data. But in engineering domains, uh, 3D data is actually um, uh, uh, more, there, there are more 3D data being used or developed in engineering domains. Um, in mechanical engineering, civil engineering, um, the engineers, they, what they do is they basically design in 3D, uh, in CAD, right? And uh, they, they, they also uh, go to the job site or go to the factory to, to perform reality capture and the data you capture are also 3D. Um, and similarly in geospatial science um, um, uh, and other areas, it's, it's very, um, lots of application domains. And uh, we're interested in um, the question of how to enable robots to recognize uh, 3D objects or understand 3D scenes. And there are some intrinsically, um, uh, there are some technical challenges um, in order to answer this question. Um, it is not as simple as just generalizing the 2D, like deep learning on 2D image data directly to 3D. And we'll talk more about that um, in, in my talk today. So, um, in order to process 3D uh, data using deep learning, we need to talk about how to represent 3D data. And uh, very generally, there are the following four categories. The first one is voxel representation. Basically, you discretize the 3D space into the screens, and we call them as voxels, as, generalized, as the generalization from pixels. Um, there are also uh, another way of representing 3D data, what um, people call this as multi-view. So you basically uh, uh, take multiple uh, photos surrounding an object. And so usually this is uh, for object level um, uh, 3D deep learning. And, um, and then you treat this as a set of images. So you can use regular 2D CNN to, to process it. Um, of course, point clouds and meshes are recently becoming very popular. Uh, they are uh, a lot of times the raw format that you get um, from the field. And, uh, and uh, yet how to process this have certain challenges that needs to be, um, we, need to, we need to take care of that from the design of the network architectures. Um, last but not least, primitives is also very commonly used in, um, in like uh, computer graphics, uh, robotics, uh, because of their simplicity and their compactness um, in terms of the representation. Uh, but how to process that in um, deep networks is also an op open-ended question. So today, uh, my talk is going to uh, cover uh, uh, the voxel and point cloud related representations. Um, and we're going to talk about this from two different scales, at the object scale um, and also at the street scene scale. One from the soft robotics application domain and another from the self-driving uh, uh, domain. All right, so the first uh, is the soft robotics. Um, I guess because of this audience, I assume not many of you are aware of the concept of soft robotics. So I put this uh, animation. Um, I hope you like it. It's uh, from the Big Hero, Big Hero 6, I, one of my favorite movie. Um, so in that movie, there is this animation character, Baymax. Uh, Baymax can be think about as, as, as a very simple uh, way to introduce uh, soft robots. Uh, it's basically, um, robots are not always rigid, all right? Um, uh, uh, when robots are made from these kind of compliant soft materials, um, they can be uh, uh, having certain advantages than rigid robots um, in, in many important areas. Uh, because they are soft and compliant, um, they have higher flexibility and adaptability to the environment. And also, they are intrinsically safer to work with, unlike the rigid robots, right? In the in the in the manufacturing factories, when you have these robot arms, they you, they usually need to be locked in a cage. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, humans 
uh, could get injured or killed by those rigid robots. But soft robots are, are safer uh, to work with. And they have huge impacts on our society um, from different application domains. In construction, you have this kind of soft exoskeleton where the workers, they can wear um, in order to support them. Um, um, and and uh, you, have, you can use this for material handling um, on the upper lane and, and lower lane. You can use this in healthcare domains to help people um, in tasks like uh, rehabilitation. Um, however, soft robots are um, not, um, has not exp uh, exhibited their full potential yet. Uh, this is because it has suffered from a long-standing heart problem. Um, and this, this, this problem uh, originates from the challenge that uh, soft robots have almost infinite de degrees of freedom. Uh, you can basically, because of it, it's soft, it's just think about Baymax. You can, you can poke it at anywhere and, 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 and it will deform. So basically with such a complex uh, system, how do you computationally represent it? This is first open-ended question. And uh, without a good way to represent it, it will be, di be difficult for you to estimate its state. And furthermore, it will be difficult for you to do any uh, like closed loop control. So one example to example to 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 show this um, challenge is the proprioception of a soft body. What this means is, um, uh, for a human body, we have, although vision is one of our uh, main uh, sensory uh, input, but we also have this proprioception sensing in a sense that you can close your eye and try to touch your nose uh, and your ears and and touch your fingers. You can do that without looking at at it, right? If try it. If you cannot do that, maybe it's time to 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 go to the doctors. Um, and uh, for rigid robot arms, it is easy to do um, because this is a like many decades of research have been have been put into that. You simply uh, uh, model these these robots. Um, they're they're relatively low degree have low degrees of freedoms, and you just put this angular um, uh, kind of encoders at different joints and just measure that angle changes or the linear encoders to measure the, the distance changes. And then you can get a full representation of the rigid robots. Um, however, for soft body, um, because it can be bent and twisted at and almost anywhere, how do we represent this? This is, this is unknown. Okay. Um, existing methods uh, people have tried to uh, uh, tackle this this challenge. Uh, uh, existing methods have been can be roughly divided into two groups: physics-based models or learning-based models. So, physics-based model, models are basically using the finite element analysis methods. Um, however, they cannot solve this kind of like visual like proprioception problem very very well, and a lot of times it, this computational speed is just too slow for them to be applied in real-time robotics applications. And moreover, the calibration of such systems can be tedious. Um, so people have tend to uh, 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 focus on learning-based methods to address those challenges. Uh, for example, uh, Cornell, they have tried this research um, by using the, the optical fibers um, and, uh, and get this uh, 16, uh, uh, I think, uh, eight by eight grid of um, uh, sensor readings and then try to uh, regress the bending and twist angle of such a um, uh, robot finger, okay? And uh, uh, Georgia Tech also tried to uh, do this using, by, by, by representing the soft finger uh, with only the tip position, like the XYZ location of the tip point of this soft finger. Um, however, um, these methods are oversimplified and um, they, because because a soft body can be bent anywhere and uh, it is difficult to represent the, the system with only the tip position or only the bend or twist angle. Um, so it also, this kind of simplified representation misses the advantage um, of soft robots. So we argue that soft robotics really need a learnable full body representation um, in order to be used in the downstream applications. So, um, one obvious example, uh, like, a, like a, a, a choice of such a full body representation would be 3D point clouds. Um, because um, these point clouds can be, you can easily capture that by using 3D scanners. Um, and like 
engineers are familiar with this, with LiDAR sensors or, or this kind of like um, the, the uh, stereo cameras, you can easily get a full body surface of, of, a, of a soft body. However, the challenge or, and the question is, uh, is 3D point cloud compatible with existing deep learning architectures? Because point clouds are intrinsically different than images. You can, if you think about it, is it basically a, um, a three by n, uh, n by three matrix where each row of this matrix represents a coordinate uh, in 3D. And you can arbitrarily uh, uh, switch the order of the rows without changing the underlying shape um, of that uh, uh, represented by that point cloud. So um, luckily, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the community um, have developed this really nice tools like PointNet, where basically uh, it used this um, uh, 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 the pointwise uh, multi-layer perceptrons to process each point in the point cloud independently, and then through a global feature aggregation, you you can uh, perform uh, feature learning in a supervised way. And then later on, the, I think the same group did this um, unsupervised or self-supervised point cloud autoencoder. Uh, to try to learn a good representation of 3D shapes, uh, point clouds um, uh, uh, directly. Uh, what they're doing is basically they use the point cloud as the encoder, then you get a, a global code word, um, a K by one dimensional uh, code word and try to decode. So the key is the decoder. How do we decode uh, the points from this very compact code word? Uh, what they were doing in that paper was very simple. Basically you use a large MLP and um, uh, you, you, you uh, leave the dimension from K to three N and then you reshape it to an N by three matrix. Um, um, and then after that, you can just uh, minimize the, the, the difference between the input and the reconstruction using something called chain for distance. Uh, there are different ways of, of naming that. Basically it's, it's trying to minimize the, the shape similar, uh, uh, this similarity between the two shapes. The issue about this baseline method is that, first of all, the network of this decoder have too many uh, parameters um, because the number of n is usually large. And I gave here, I gave some uh, 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 numbers here. So usually we use like a 1000 uh, uh, numbers to represent the, uh, the, the compact latent code and the number of points um, can go very large. Um, so that makes this number of parameters to be optimized uh, uh, grows very large and and it's it's not very difficult uh, not very easy to 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 optimize. Uh, another downside of this is um, because uh, MLP needs to fix this n. So once you trained it, this decoder can only always decode the same number of points. Um, uh, but this does not. Um, this is a disadvantage because for some simple shapes, you don't need that many points. Yet for some more complex shapes, you need more points to represent enough geometric details, right? So how can we do better? Um, that was the question we asked. So um, at, in 2017, we start investigating this problem and we got insp inspired uh, by the origami or paper folding. Uh, so basically uh, you can think about this as a 2D to 3D nonlinear mapping, uh, right? That our, our key insight is a lot of the 3D points that we get um, like from this common public available data sets or from our, our own sensors, they're actually obtained from object surfaces. You, you don't really get points inside the object, right? Um, because they are either discretized, sampled from the CAD models surfaces, or they are captured by line of sight uh, sensors like LIDAR or stereo cameras. Um, then understanding that, uh, would lead us to think, okay, object surfaces are intrinsically 2D manifold, right? So you can actually, theoretically, you can transform um, uh, any 2D plane uh, to form any complex, arbitrarily complex 3D shapes, as long as you allow uh, some of the discontinuous uh, operations. Um, like uh, in addition to folding, you can have tearing, stretching, gluing operations. So uh, based on this intuition, we were thinking if we can design a decoder that basically mimics this highly nonlinear paper folding process as a 2D to, to 3D mapping, then we can use it um, in the reconstruction, in the decoder to reconstruct 3D object surfaces more efficiently and more flexible. 
So this leads us to the folding network uh, that we present in, in CVPR 2018 as, an, uh, as a, a spotlight paper. Uh, to, to summarize the paper uh, in one sentence, it's basically a deep parametric surface that you can think about it as, as a generalization from the B spline surfaces, right? Um, engineers are, are very familiar with this kind of um, surfaces because we always use it to do design. Um, essentially, for such a surface, you have uh, knot or weight vectors, and then you have control points. Control points, by, by tuning the control points, you can change the shape that you design, and the knot vector basically changes the basis functions, right? So differently, folding net is a neural network version of it. Um, and uh, it, it treats this latent code of the shape as the control points. You can, you can make an analogy between the two. Control points are like, the, the code word are like control points. And the, uh, the uh, not vectors in the B-spline surface um, are like the, net, the network parameters that you need to learn, okay? And then this T um, are the fixed grids, or basically, the, uh, the, the input to the, um, or this basically the time variable or, or the two dimensional variable you sample from the spaces function. Okay, so looking at it from a ar network architecture perspective, the encoder is, is trivial, which is get it from the, the, the point net or any other state of the art architectures. You get this latent code. Okay, once you get this latent code, you want to use this latent code to um, instruct or to help you deform this 2D paper, right? Basically a, a 2D grid um, um, uh, independently for each point on this 2D grid into a 3D shape, okay? So basically you can, you can sample points from a 2D plane and you get each 2D coordinates appended, um, concatenated with the code word. And then you, you go through a, you send this concatenated uh, uh, feature vector through a uh, point-wise MLP, just like in the encoder in PointNet, and you decrease the dimension from two plus k. K is the uh, feature uh, latent feature dimension. Two is basically this two D sample grids dimension. You decrease you decrease it from from two plus two to three for all the points uh, that you sample. Okay, and then you get an n by three matrix, and this matrix can be again. Uh, um, uh, Minim, uh, uh, trained by minimizing the difference between the input and output using the same chamfer distance uh, loss function. Okay, so uh, the the good thing of this is now the network para uh, uh, parameters is significantly reduced. Um, it it is independent from number n now because this MLP only needs to decrease the dimension from almost k to three, and k is only a few like one thousand ish. Okay, and once it is trained, you can arbitrarily change this number n in your decoder. Basically, if I want to decode 1,000 points, I just sample 1,000 points from this paper, piece of paper. Or if I want to decode 10,000, I just increase the number of samples. And, and that, that, that is independent from uh, the training process. You can, after, during the training, if you want to um, benefit from the batch, uh, mini batch training, you still use fix the, the, the number n, but during inference, you can average, arbitrarily change it. Um, Chen, sorry, may, may I ask a question here? This is, this is uh, really uh, great. Uh, do you want us to save the questions for the last or do no, you no, want- No, 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 feel free. <laughs> so yes. one question is uh, regarding the two-dimensional uh, essentially plane that we have here, or the two-dimensional manifold two, mm -hmm. and, and deforming it in the three-dimensional space, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but like, uh, as you mentioned, this like you need to like I don't as of now I don't exactly know the, how do you handle tear or gluing and things like that. This is all implicitly learned in that F theta. It's all implicit, yes. It's right. like okay. the previous slides was really just the intuition. When we implemented, okay. it's not we're not explicitly implement the tearing or or the stretching. Uh, my co-authors after this work they did another work called tearing net. Um, yeah, so which tries to explicitly add this tearing operation into the process. In our, in this work, FoldingNet, uh, everything is implicit, implicitly captured in this function f data. Okay, so uh, then uh, the, the real question that I had was, so 
can you use a volumetric grid as opposed to a two-dimensional grid? And then Very, yeah. it, it has displacements uh, in yes. the three you, you can totally do so. Once actually in a, in a, in a few slides later, you will see uh, in, the, in, the, in the soft robot application, we actually change it to, um, well, not, not necessarily volumetric, but as we call it like a prototype shape of the, of the uh, zero state robot surface. Uh, we also, in the original paper, we did the volumetric uh, for the data set that we, we used in FoldyNet, uh, it was ShapeNet. Uh, we found that increasing it to three dimension actually doesn't help. Uh, it's exactly due to the reason I mentioned, because the, 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 point, the point clouds in those, in those data sets are sampled from object surfaces, from those CAD models, right? So using a, a three, like a, a volumetric grid is, is an overkill. You only, the intrinsic dimension is really just two of that manifold. Uh, yeah, but but essentially yes, you can totally change this to four three dimension, four dimension uh, on this on this fixed grid. That doesn't really uh, uh, matter uh, to the whole architecture. Mm. Uh, sorry, maybe I didn't hear the answer. But uh, how do you deal with the topology changes? So like, if you wanted a sphere, mm -hmm. would you start with th this grid, or would you start with a sphere instead, or or could f theta learn learn the transformation to to, or uh, that's, a, to that's a very good question. So basically, the the we, the basically the genesis you're talking about. If the if there are holes in the, on the surface, right? The genus number is a is a key um, 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 like a difficulty. If you are sampling from a, a, a yeah. genus <laughs> zero and the the reconstruction actually is 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 different. Um, with enough training, I would say um, it it sort of still works because this is a, you are sampling from this field. After you're sampling, you're deforming it. Um, the network will basically learn to, to uh, Bend it uh, very push. Far, yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> However, it is not very efficient. You need a very long training on a large data set in order to get reasonable um, uh, shape reconstruction performance. For more details of that, you can check the FoldyNet paper. We actually showed it. There are some, some chairs actually have holes. Um, yeah. they're, they're, they're really not this kind of shape. And the network can still learn, but you need significant number of iterations, uh, training iterations, in order for it to learn. So our uh, the later on uh, Turing network does better in terms of this. But the network architecture is more more complex than than what I can explain here. <laughs> yeah. oh, thank you. That's a great answer. I'll check that out. Uh, Turing network. Okay. Yeah. And as the, there is one more question in the chat. Uh, uh, Anwar said, uh, how about if the number of points change in the training or test samples uh, yeah. for a small and large objects? Yeah, that's a good question. So basically uh, what we do is we just sample them. We fix during the training. We want to utilize the batch training so we can accelerate the training, right? So, uh, uh, so we, we just uh, resample the points so they all have the same number during, same number n during training. But during inference, you can arbitrarily change this. Uh, this number uh, yeah. uh, sorry uh, so how do you fix the number of points sorry you um, just examine your data sets and one okay. way is you can just check uh, what is the largest number of points what is the largest number n you have in each instance of your data and then fix that okay and for the, all the other examples that have smaller uh, n you just resample uh, from the the the, the points just repeat them. Oh, okay. Okay. So yeah. it's then it's going to be dependent on the data set, right? So yes. you need to, you know, explore the data set, find the number of you know, right. maximum right. points. So yes. F there is an instance uh, and test set, which is like uh, more than points, more than the number of points on for which the model is trained. Then you have to cut it. Then you have to, okay. uh, you have to drop some points. Let's say if you fix the N to be 1000 and in one instance, one data instance in your data set, it have 5,000 points, then you will have to just uh, 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 sample 1,000 from that 5,000 points. Does that answer your question? Okay, uh, Okay, but, but the thing is when you drop number of points, then you, you lose. definitely you are losing the data, That's right? right? So how That's do right. you, how do yes. you, yeah. So how this is unfortunately, it? this is unfortunately you have to make this design, you have to make this, design choice is like a hyperparameter in your during training phase because you want to utilize i mean theoretically it doesn't prevent us from doing it because you can just uh you, if you don't want to utilize the batch training this is not a problem 
it is really a problem due to batch training. So you need to form a batch like a B by N by K or B by N by three uh, input uh, training set, right? So theoretically, um, if, if you don't care about the, the training speed, then we just, we just, the N can be dynamic. They can vary between different inputs. But because we need to use the batch, mini batch training, we want to make sure all the points in the same batch, all the, all the objects in the same batch should have the same number N. Then you have to, you have to deal with it. Either you resample to add the data or you just drop some, some, some points. And, and that really is an engineering uh, issue, not a, yeah. not a, not a, a, a network design issue. I would say, yeah, because the because of the encoder and decoder modulus, and because it it works on the grid structure data, and you know the grid should have the same number of you know uh, input points and number of parameters. So I was thinking about the network representation of these objects, like if you represent them as a network, and then you have like a, you know a, a graph machine learning module, which can learn the similar types of you know optimization functions. So uh, are there any work in that direction? Yeah, I think uh, there are some, but you can think about this is you're talking about using a, re a network to represent the, the input shape, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, this but that's way, essentially think... what we're doing here. <laughs> so you need, to you need to learn that network in order to represent an input shape. So here, before you have that, you need to, you need to so this is essentially, this is a self-supervised way of learning such a representation. Once you have that, this code, code word can be used to represent the shape. So it's a chicken and egg problem. If you want to, depends on whether which where you want to start. If you start from a, a, a just the data set with no other representation, then you have to again the same issue will show up again. Okay, thank you. Uh, and, uh, yeah, maybe uh, uh, Chen, uh, you 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 would need to have time to finish. So so we, we stop the questions <laughs> sure. right now. No problem. Uh, That's okay. Good. I, I enjoy the discussion, so no worries. Yeah, I can accelerate if needed in the future. Uh, so then, basically, after that, we uh, we show uh, these uh, uh, learn some of the uh, visualization of what has been learned, and this is a very interesting visualization because once once you learn such a network, uh, you can you can you can see this kind of like uh, um, uh, folding creases. Basically, uh, you can compute the curvatures on that manifold. And you can also compute the neighborhood distance uh, in 3D uh, and then show them as a, as a 2D image on that piece of paper. And this basically corresponds to the folding creases or the tearing or stretching lines. So um, uh, theoretically, I can, I can print this on a piece of paper and cut the paper and then fold it uh, to get such a, a, a sofa shape, right? And what's beautiful about this is it's totally learned in an unsupervised way. Uh, I'm, not a good, I'm not good at like paper folding, but this network learns how to uh, reconstruct this shape automatically. So coming back to, to, to the, the uh, soft robot application, how is that connected? How is the folding net connected to the soft robot question that we raised before? Basically, folding net decoder is a good way to, uh, 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 to uh, represent, or you can utilize the folding net decoder um, in such a pipeline in order to represent and also estimate the shape of a, of a, a 3D object. So essentially, you have some self-observing signals of the soft body. Uh, in this case, we're basically uh, putting um, some cameras inside this Baymax toy. And we put five cameras inside, internally inside this toy. So it observes this kind of color pattern, random color patterns that we, we paint inside. And then based on these five images, um, although we're showing this as a video, but we're actually doing it um, uh, uh, frame by frame independently. So you collect these five images, concatenate them, and send it through a ResNet, get a latent code. And, and then you can use the FoldingNet decoder. Um, this is slightly um, an improved version compared to FoldingNet in the sense that we're not uh, fold a piece of paper, but actually a prototype shape of the zero state of this of this uh, uh, Baymax uh, uh, toy in order to, to deform it to its estimated shape. And here, we cannot do self-supervise anymore. We need to collect the ground truth 3D shape um, in order to compute this uh, chain for distance uh, to train both the decoder and the ResNet. But luckily, this kind of shape uh, uh, capturing is very easy. 
uh, you just put a uh, like a, a Kinect camera during the dataset collection phase. You use the Kinect camera to observe uh, the the 3D shapes uh, when, when whenever it deforms, um, and then you build such a dataset uh, with images and corresponding uh, full body uh, point cloud, and you train the network. Um, and after training, you can you can deploy this uh, uh, during during the inference stage. You can remove the Kinect camera, just rely on the five internal embedded cameras. You can estimate the three D shape with high accuracy, high resolution. This is the ground truth, um, and uh, we achieve high speed, more than five hundred, like four four hundred hertz on the desktop GPU. Uh, the accuracy is relative accuracy is less than one percent. Um, and it's pretty easy to set up. And this is the first uh, work that allows uh, people to do this kind of full body uh, uh, shape estimation from only internal observation. There are zero external third party cameras during the inference stage. And it, right now we're, we're, we're doing more work on, on applying this to soft robotics community and hope to address uh, their, some of their uh, uh, like uh, control um, and, and state estimation challenges. So here are some additional uh, details. Um, basically, you can ignore those numbers. It's really just used to show uh, how accurate this thing is. Um, and uh, just to quick recap this part, uh, we explain to you using Baymax as an example, what is a soft robot and, uh, and what are the benefits of this kind of soft robot? And also, we, we explain how to use this folding net, uh, like, which is a self-supervised 3D, 3D deep learning technique to address the challenges in soft robotics. Um, I guess I have already answered enough questions for this section. Maybe in the interest of time, I should just move on to the second half of the talk, uh, which uh, moves us to from the object level, because these kind of uh, soft robot, I really their finger, like. Like handle size or 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 just small body size is really not a sync level or a sync scale three D deep learning. When we talk about sync scale three uh, D deep learning, uh, we move on to the self driving case, and this is a very hot topic in both uh, ba basically all the AI communities, <laughs> from vision to to robotics to machine learning. Okay, so um, what's interesting is in self driving. Uh, most of the research has been focusing on this single robot or single agent perception. Uh, it has been extensively studied. Um, and uh, however, we're, we want to point out several fundamental challenges in this single agent perception. The first is the long range perception, um, where you will encounter the data sparsity issues, right? The LIDAR, when it gets, when the object gets further away from the sensor, you get very minimal, uh, small number of samples, point samples. Uh, another issue is the occlusion. Uh, when, and this is all kinds of visual sensors that suffer from this. Um, when, when the objects are occluded, it's becoming difficult for you to make any perception decisions. So obvious, like very naturally, people are thinking, can we combine multiple uh, uh, agents' uh, field of views together in order to uh, improve this, fundamentally address these challenges? So for example, here in the Uber's uh, uh, paper uh, V2V nets, they show that um, if you are able to uh, send one vehicle's uh, uh, observation as a latent message to another vehicle, um, it will be improve the robustness of the perception. Even if some of like this pedestrian is occluded by the screen car from this car's perspective, but because of this car looks at this person and they transmit this message uh, to this ego vehicle, it actually increased the safety and robustness of the perception system. Um, basically, when you are allowed such kind of like collaborative perception, um, you can see the whole system can see further, they can see better, they can see through occlusions. Okay? Um, and uh, in order to realize this, this uh, benefit, there are two important research questions we have to answer. The first one is what kind of information should we transmit? Um, there are basically three strategies. First is the early collaboration, right? The simple, this is like naive way. If you just share the raw point clouds with each other, then uh, that's, the, that's the easiest way. Uh, the, 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 the good thing is you, there are no information loss. You share the raw data with each other. 
and it's easy to combine in 3D space. But the difficulty or, or the challenge, uh, the disadvantage is that um, it is very expensive uh, in terms of bandwidth, communication bandwidth. Um, if you have like n number of uh, vehicles, each vehicle needs to receive uh, n minus one uh, point clouds from, uh, from the other vehicles. And, and this grows um, uh, linearly and each point like raw point cloud is already a very large uh, uh, volume to be communicated. Um, another uh, uh, strategy is late collaboration. Basically, each vehicle make their own individual uh, uh, decision, and then you just share this decision. Using 3D object detection as, a, as an example, each vehicle can decide what kind of object they detect, and then they just share this result uh, with their uh, neighbors. Um, the good thing is this is very complex. Like, communication is almost zero, right? The box parameters is only a few numbers. Um, but the, the, diff, but the, the, the disadvantage is you lose this contextual information. Uh, some, think about an example. One vehicle, uh, vehicle A can only see partially vehicle C, and vehicle B can only see another part of the vehicle C. So this vehicle C may, may not be detected on both vehicle A and vehicle B, OK? Uh, but in this late collaboration, you will miss the chance of discovering that vehicle C um, uh, because they they just they were not discussed uh, di discovered in any in any vehicles. So people start to look into this intermediate collaboration. Uh, basically, if we can uh, share the intermediate feature maps from the network, the latent features, then we we could have this uh, uh, merit from both ends. Okay, we can reduce. Uh, the, the communication volume. We can also enjoy the contextual information shared between each other. However, it is not it is it is not trivial to um, collaborate or fuse the information in a high dimensional feature space. Okay? Um, so uh, existing strategies to fuse these information um, are uh, shown in these two works. Uh, V2V Net, which is from Uber, and then when to come or, uh, or who to come uh, from Georgia Tech. So there, um, uh, there are some um, uh, challenges or, or, or disadvantages in these um, uh, existing strategies. First is the latency challenge. The V2V Net requires multiple iterations of mes message passing. Basically, they're treating this as a graph neural network, and they need to do multiple rounds of message passing, which actually increased significantly in the communication volume, more than the early collaboration strategy, more than the raw, sharing the raw data. Um, and uh, when to come or who to come, they, they, they use, design this handshake uh, 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 strategy, which also in introduced certain uh, more additional latency uh, in, the, in the system. And moreover, um, both of them use the scalared weights uh, when they share these messages. Um, which lose the spatial information. Uh, essentially, they're using this scalar value between any two neighbors, neighboring vehicle, to decide the importance of sharing message between that two uh, uh, agents. Okay, we're arguing that this actually lose the you lose the spatial information because um, um, this whether to share message between two vehicles decide uh, depends not only based on how far or close they are from each other, but also depends on the object. You, uh, 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 it, you, you need to think about which, which part, uh, which place in this environment uh, you want to uh, perform perception, like right? 3D object detection. So that decision depends not only between the two agents, but also depends on these third uh, uh, spatial locations. So here comes to our collaborative perception problem setup. Basically, we assume there are multiple agents uh, located in the same geographical area. Um, they can collaboratively perceive through communication. Um, and also, each robot has their own accurate pose. In the current days, this is not very challenging because you have good SLAN and uh, um, GPS uh, uh, information. And our goal is to maximize the perception performance um, while um, uh, under some given uh, uh, communication bandwidth. Um, and to do this, we have to optimize our collaboration strategy. So our approach can be summarized in uh, the use of a direct, fully connected directed graph with uh, the 
uh, this graph have the matrix valued edge weights to encode the spatial attention. Um, and also we're going to optimize this collaboration by graph learning. So here is the setup. Uh, given uh, an intersection, you have uh, multiple agents. Each of them can observe a certain range of, uh, of the scene. Okay. And they can communicate with each other to share information. And in this case, they're going to share the latent uh, feature map, which is a, uh, a uh, like a, a spatially decreased um, a sampled, downsampled version of the feature map uh, with a high uh, feature channel number. And also at each node, you have the uh, 60, 60 OF pose of each vehicle. So the edge are directed, which means uh, the information you shared from uh, uh, agent uh, I to agent J uh, uh, could be different, uh, 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 vice versa. Like, but the information transmitted from I to J could be different than that from J to I. Um, and it's matrix valued, as I mentioned. You, we need to encode the spatial uh, uh, attention. So uh, this allows us to build such a uh, fully connected, dynamic, and pose-aware um, uh, graph. It's dynam dynamic because this graph may be changing while all the vehicles are moving. Right? It's frame. It's it's independent uh, uh, with each other uh, during each frame. Um, so basically, at the beginning, we will consider this ego uh, uh, agent uh, vehicle one uh, having all these four neighbor vehicles, uh, two, three, four, five. They receive some feature map uh, from this neighbor. So, so the agent one will receive these four uh, original feature maps from um, each neighbors. And then because we know their poses, we're going to spatially align them into uh, agent one's coordinate frame. And then we will generate this uh, edge weight, uh, which basically uh, 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 means the spatial attention um, of like the importance of the feature of each neighboring agent's feature map. Okay, And this uh, uh, matrix valued uh, edge weights will then be uh, normalized so that we can combine them um, with the originally aligned, spatially aligned feature map uh, using this um, as a way to, you can scale down some region which you have already observed. You don't really need that information. For some other area you really want to use, you want to focus on some spatial, some area that this agent one doesn't see, right? And then you combine these, add them together, this will become the updated feature map uh, for agent one after receiving the neighborhood uh, uh, feature maps. Okay, so this is basically the collaboration process. Now, the tricky thing or the important thing is how do you learn uh, uh, this kind of like feature map? How do you learn such a network? So our collab our intuition is we want to benefit from both the early collaboration and intermediate collaboration. So. The basic idea is we want to use the knowledge distillation fr framework. So the teacher can use uh, early collaboration because we're only going to use the teacher during the training. Uh, so you basically aggregate all the raw point clouds for the teacher to train a teacher network. Okay? Um, and in this case, you don't need to worry about the communication because this only happened during training, offline training. And then we train the student network, which is the network that we will need to use during, during the deployment or inference. And uh, the student will use the intermediate collaboration strategy. Um, so it only, um, only have the single view data as the input, unlike the teacher, which have this Oracle data, which is multi-view. Okay? And then we use the knowledge distillation uh, to train the students uh, by not only supervising the output results, but also trying to uh, uh, ensure the features we learned from the teacher is similar to the feature we learned by the student. Okay, so that's the overall idea. And, uh, and this leads us to the overall framework of this disco net, which we published in uh, last year in, in Europe. And although this, this diagram seems complex, but basically it's it just implements what I just described. Um, the upper this part is the is the uh, teacher network. You you basically uh, just naively aggregate, merge all the raw point clouds, and then input this to the network uh, uh, for it to 
for the teacher network to learn the features. And uh, for the student network, uh, each of them uh, will use a share weight CNN to process this BEV representation. Here, uh, the BEV representation is basically the voxel, voxelized representation for the 3D deep learning. So instead of using raw point clouds, we're, we're voxelizing the space uh, in XYZ uh, uh, dimensions uh, uh, with more uh, voxels focusing on the XY dimension and with only um, like 13 um, uh, or, or, or less than 20 uh, dimensions for the Z axis. Um, yeah, so, so basically then you learn this, uh, this collaboration through knowledge distillation by not only uh, uh, training the detection um, uh, result, but also you try to minimize the, uh, this, the KL divergence between the intermediate feature maps. So I guess, uh, let me see how much time I have. I'm almost uh, done. So, okay, so yeah, I, I, I think I can skip these details. It's really just the, the loss functions that I ex explained. Uh, let's look at our results. So you, you can see overall, the disco net really uh, achieves the state of the art. Uh, so these block are all the intermediate collaboration uh, uh, methods. The upper bound methods, which is basically the early collaboration, gives you the highest number, uh, IOU, um, for the ob 3D object detection. And the, the lower bound, which is the late collaboration, uh, uh, this is actually, uh, oh, this, this one is the, the single agent uh, uh, performance. Um, and once you allow the late collaboration, it improves the performance, but still uh, lower than the upper bound. And, and then you look at all the intermediate uh, uh, methods, uh, the dis disco net achieves the, uh, the best performance. Okay. More details can be found on our disco net paper. Um, we also uh, did ablation studies to show that uh, this um, uh, knowledge distillation loss does help when you remove the no knowledge distillation, the performance will drop. Um, and uh, here are some visualization of, of what has been learned. So this is the edge weights. Uh, uh, um, for the spatially uh, arranged uh, uh, edge weights. Basically, this is the, the matrix valued edge that I'm talking about. This is the self edge from agent one to agent one. This is from the, the edge weight from agent two to agent one. And you see very, very, very nicely that uh, agent one have no uh, measurement in this area. So it gives higher weights to agent uh, two because agent two does see this area. Right, um, and this allows it uh, to to better detect these objects. Um, even it has zero observation in this area. Okay, um, and these are the uh, uh, lower bound and the upper bound results. And these are just more results showing such a behavior, which which is kind of like natural, right, as expected. Uh, we also did this performance versus band bandwidth trade-off. Uh, so you can uh, plot the communication volume ver versus the performance in log scale. And we show that the disco nets really, um, uh, compared to other baselines like uh, V2V net, we are really doesn't increase the communication. We're, we're actually the lowest uh, in terms of communication while we maintain the performance. So uh, I will quite uh, very quickly go through the data set we use because this is now open uh, publicly released for everybody to use. It's called V2X Sim. It's right now uh, uh, just published uh, uh, at a, a robotics and automation letter recently. Um, it's a simulated data set that we did using Carla um, and, and Sumo. Sumo is a, a traffic flow simulator uh, to generate uh, realistic, uh, numerically realistic traffic flows. And then you render this in Carla environment and, and it allows you to set up virtual uh, sensors with ground truth labels. Um, and you can, we, we uh, further write code to, do, to enable multi-agent recordings. So you're not only recording for one vehicle, you record synchronized uh, uh, data from uh, uh, different vehicles in the same scene. And it's multimodality. You have LiDAR camera, GPS, IMU. Um, you have all the uh, ground truth information richly annotated. And these are some visualization. Different color represents different agent. 
uh, in the same area. And um, yeah, and we also released the, the, the software. It's an open uh, software library called Code Perception. And we welcome um, everybody to contribute like new baselines or data set to this um, um, uh, software library to facilitate the development of this, uh, of this research direction. So to quickly recap what I just talked, uh, I introduced collaborative perception, which could address some fundamental challenges for 3D perception. Um, and, uh, and I introduced this disco net, which is a spatial attentional collaboration graph trained via knowledge distillation. Um, with that, I would like to acknowledge all my students, collaborators, and funding agencies. Um, happy to take more questions. Great, great. Thank you so much. And this was fantastic. Uh, let's thank our speaker very fast. Great. Thank you. Um, questions? I have a quick one, uh, Chen. Um, so this, this perception is assumed to be passive, right? Like in the sense that the perception is not going to change the behavior of the agents, right? It's a very good, that's a very good future research direction. Okay. You're, and you're right. We're not right now. This is passive. We're not doing active perception for collaborative perception yet. Got it. Nevertheless, it's like it's it's really really cool. Yes. Thanks. Any other questions? And so just, just in case anyone is interested in this, because I think this collaborative perception is a big new research area that uh, several groups, um, including the, the new things uh, uh, group, they are, they are all interested in this. So we really hope more, more researchers, especially from hardcore machine learning communities can come and work in this direction because it's super interesting. And, and also the data set is ready. It's not like uh, w although it's simulated, but I think it's a very good starting point. And I know my group and several other groups are also uh, working on, on creating uh, real world collaborative perception data sets. Uh, so yeah, feel free to take a look at the data set. Um, it, you can just, you can already download it. It's, it's quite large though. Um, and the, the code, the, the software, um, uh, the, the benchmark like baseline, all those things are publicly available already. That's fantastic. Uh, absolutely. So um, I have one more question. If <laughs> I'm, I'm hugging the questions. So um, in, in the disconnect part, um, there is a um, internal voxel based uh, representation that we talked about, right? Yes. Yes. Um, so I mean, like whenever we have voxel based representation for three dimensional volumes, I, I get a little un uneasy because <laughs> that's right. And the resolution is usually not that good, right? Like yes. you can't. Yes. So what are the like what are uh, the things that we can do there to um, like increase the uh, resolution a little bit? And is there room for any implicit uh, networks to be used um, there? So uh, that's a very good question. So um, the, the voxelization right now, it's, uh, I think we divide this, um, the spatial resolution of each pixel um, in that voxel representation in XY uh, plane is actually quite small. It's, 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 a, it's a problem, I think, I forgot the details, but I think it's less than uh, 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter. So if you think about it, this is actually, the, the, the community, the robotics self-driving community, I feel they're converging to this BV representation, which which means bird's eye view representation. It is, it is really just a new a, a new name for the old thing for the for the voxel um, uh, uh, representation. The reason now they can use it uh, for self-driving is because um, instead of evenly uh, uh, put even uh, resolution like the same resolution on all the three dimensions, they focus more on the X, Y, because in self-driving, you have limited height in, in, the three, in the Z dimension, right? So usually they divide the space into 200, 250 by 250 by 16 or 32, right? And in this way, you can actually treat this as, a, as, as 32 2D images concatenated in the feature, in the pixel uh, uh, channel, like the, the, the feature channel. So, and then you can use just regular 2D, uh, 
to process. You don't even use a 3D CNN. It's still a 2D CNN. So, um, so in that way, somehow uh, I found the industry and, and also the research community have somewhat converged to these representation uh, uh, more. And, and the resolution issue doesn't seem to be uh, a concern uh, so far. But I, I, I totally agree with you. I, I didn't like voxelized representation before. Um, so if the, like, let's say this kind of like um, um, implicit representation, like occupancy network, those kind of thing, um, they could be used. Um, the only good, I guess the only downside of that is you need to uh, process it through another uh, uh, network. Um, and, and then makes the follow up following like how to combine this occupancy network with the follow-up downstream uh, uh, applet like uh, processing using CNN is not very uh, straightforward. So that's why people still, I would say that the image-based representation is still very, very, um, I guess because there are many good tools in 2D CNN. So people want to stick with it. Fantastic, thank you, thank you. That's a great question, uh, great answer, thank you. Um, any other questions? Okay, if not, I think actually we are just barely uh, over time. Um, if there are no more questions, you can thank our speaker one more time. Um, we... Thanks a lot for inviting me. Absolutely, thank you. We'll be in touch, Chip. Sure, <laughs> definitely. Thank you, have a good one. Bye everyone. Thank you.